Today I've decided to sit on an exercise ball so I can uh, fall over. <laughs> Today we're covering equal rights. Finally, we're onto a book I actually enjoyed. You can still see the development of the way Pratchett writes from the last two and I'll link above to my video about the colour of magic and the light fantastic. You can still see Pratchett is growing his world. Before I get carried away, I'm going to describe the plot of this book. Unlike the last one, it's actually possible to describe the plot of this without just rereading the book. So basically there's a wizard who is dying and he wants to give his staff to the next strongest wizard who is the eighth son of the eighth son. The whole thing around the number eight, I didn't mention it in the last video, but there's a whole section in The Colour of Magic and the Light Fantastic where uh, Rincewind gets stuck. Well, actually, it's Two Flower gets stuck and then Rincewind has to go save him. And if you say the word eight, then something bad happens. Honestly, I, I didn't pay attention. Sorry, Pratchett, I do like your books, really. I just zoned out. So in this book, you have the eighth son of the eighth son. You have Esk's dad, who is a blacksmith, and he's the eighth son. He has seven sons and his wife is pregnant. So this wizard comes along and says, oh, your next son will be the whatever it is. And at the last minute, turns out it's a girl. Yes, we're talking feminism. This book starts off with the witches um, and Granny Weatherwax and then moves into Ankh-Morpork. They go off to try and become a wizard. Granny doesn't believe that a woman can be a wizard, um, but it still supports Esk because it's the right thing to do. They then because sexism are not admitted to the university and the university think that it's actually a joke. So they then become servants and then through lots of adventures Esk makes friends with a boy because all girls in book have to meet a boy so the boy can push the plot along. Even if it's not romantic, this is a rule of books and bite me if you think I'm wrong. I'm not putting across my point very well but basically I was complaining about the fact that in Terry Pratchett's esteemed colleague Neil Gaiman's book Coraline they felt the need to add in an extra teenage boy character because apparently Coraline couldn't just get thing on with things herself. Whereas in the book, she was fine all by herself being a badass. Anyway, Simon, brilliant name for a wizard, who is Esk's friend who has actually been admitted, does stuff. Basically, they end up back in the dungeon dimensions, which we saw before in The Colour of Magic and Light Fantastic. They faff around a bit happy ending. One thing a lot of people didn't like about this book for ages was the fact that we never really found out what happened to Esk. Um, a lot of the wizards didn't come back, I don't think we ever see Simon again. Granny Weatherwax is fine and she obviously appears in a lot more books in a more rounded character. So in this book I see her as a mix of what I think of as Granny and I also think of as Nanny Og when Nanny Og comes along. There's a scene near the beginning where Esk is born and uh, Granny is all doing coochie coo coochie coo and that's that's a Nanny Og thing. That's not a Granny Weatherwax thing. Granny is the death person. She's the person who takes people out of this life as comfortably as possible. There's later on scenes where she's talking about abortions and it's all quite dark. I think it's in Lords and Ladies where she's doing it, talking about abortions. She has to make a choice between the mother and the child and she's asked, why didn't you ask the father? And Granny Weatherwax says, well, Basically, that's a terrible thing to make someone have to choose. So she had to make that choice for the village people. I don't mean that village people. <laughs> and she's a dark, dark woman, but in a light way. And I, as we go on, I'll obviously talk more about Granny Weatherwax and the way she sort of embodies this sort of side of life that's around the death. Nanny Og is more there for the births. Nanny Og brings you into the world. In later books, when we have Nanny Og, we have Granny, and then we also have Magrat. I always see it that Nanny Og brings you into the world, Magrat looks after you while you're in the world, and the Granny is the one who helps you towards the end. But here, she's just not as well-rounded a character. She's definitely old guard. She's definitely carrying on the sexism which is there in the world. Witches are witches. You can't have male witches. Men can't do all the herbology stuff and the headology stuff. Men have to do the wizardry, the things that have big robes and symbols and power, whereas women are the little people who actually help things in real life. So it's quite interesting seeing that dynamic that Granny is just as sexist as the wizards in the, in this book, but Esk is not. <laughs> Esk is a young girl going, well, I want to be a wizard. There's a brilliant bit that hopefully I've made notes about where Granny says, you can't have a female wizard any more than you can have a female blacksmith. And Esk goes, well, I've seen my dad do it and I can't see why I can't. And I love this instance that just shows how 
are sexual preference, sexual preferences. I don't mean sexual preferences. I love this short instance that shows how sexism really is a man-made construct. They've just decided that women can't be blacksmiths when actually Esk's just like, I can see how that works. I'll do that. It's a really good character describing moment. This book does have a bit more character development in it than the last ones. I, I definitely find the characters very flat in the first two books, whereas this one is a bit more three dimensional. Granny is less three dimensional than she is later. Esk does have that coming of age journey. Still, I don't think she goes that far. I think she gets into the wizard school, but meh. I was skipping around the book, looking at different scenes, trying to find um, a part that I'd listened to before. And I managed to skip between two different scenes which were actually connected. One was the first scene where Granny is taking over the mind of an owl and you see this in later books where she goes off and gets to experience life within them. She doesn't take them over though, she just sort of sits as a guest in their brain. What's interesting is she makes the point in the first chapter that wizards wouldn't be able to do what she does because they try and squish the mind of the animal, they try and completely take it over. And the fact is you can't learn to fly just straight away just by being in the body of an owl. You need to carefully just be a guest in there and let them do the flying and you go along with it. And then I'd skipped to a few chapters later and Esk is asking about it and Esk assumes that the way she does it is the way that Granny talks about wizards doing it. And it's one of those instances where Pratchett is making the point that Esk is a wizard basically. She thinks like a wizard, she thinks like a boy. She thinks like these other people who in the end I don't think Pratchett makes out that wizards are any worse than witches. Um, they're just different, but they're definitely a bit more, not quite as useful. The audiobook is the only one read by Celia Emery, which it's nice to have a woman's voice. I like audiobooks that have women reading them. Um, but she can't pronounce Ankh Morpork. She calls it Ankh Morpok. And that's annoying. Themes. As I've talked about before, this book is definitely around feminism and the differences between men and women, played out in this sort of satirical way between witches and wizards. This book was a shift for Pratchett, going from a satire on straight up fantasy to more of a rounded novel with an adventure and stories and characters that you wanted to learn more about. I never at any point in The Colour of Magic or Light Fantastic thought, oh, I really want to know more about Two Flower. I do sort of want to know more about the office he works in, but that's only because I'd like later life Pratchett to write about it, not earlier life Pratchett. I know a lot of people have said this, but I do like the fact that on the front cover, Esk is holding her stick a bit like a... Mm -hmm. Now, I want to take issue with something written on Elle's face. As a car enthusiast, I do really love the line, if broomsticks were cars, this one would be a split screen Morris Minor. Because if anyone doesn't know, which most people probably don't, I own a pre-war Morris, not a Morris Minor, and they're so practical. Yes, it only goes at 50 miles an hour, but it's comfortable, it's got a little curtain in the back, and it's basically the same as the Morris Minor just a few years earlier. Basically, if I had a broomstick, it would definitely be in the elk of a Morris Minor. <laughs> so this book was released in 1987, so we're still four years before I was born, and it still has a lot of fantasy, the play on fantasy. It's a lot of play on witches and the stupid old crones, but a lot of really serious topics. They go to visit a witch who, is basically an abortionist. They try and hide it from Esk and they try and make sure that Esk doesn't realise what she does but she talks about how she keeps on nearly being thrown out of the village but all of the men in the council have wives and they know that they'd be much poorer and have way more children if she wasn't there. Lastly, um, looking on Goodreads, this has got a 4.02 rating which isn't too bad really. The uh, Colour of Magic and Light Fantastic are all just under four stars, but more pushes right up to 4.23 stars. Oh, sorcery hasn't got the best, says something. So actually this is one of the higher rating books in the whole series. Um, at some point I will totally do a graph of all the good read ratings and if I get around to it, I might even, I don't know which way I've filmed this, I might even show it here and let you have a little look. This is also the first book where we talk about headology. My favourite thing. This is something that when I was a teenager I really really wanted to be granny because I wanted to do headology. Um, then I realised I don't do people and I don't really care what they think. This is why I'm a project manager and I manage people. So 
what did I think of this book? I thought it was a really good move away from the first two books. He starts to feel his voice. He starts to feel like Terry Pratchett, but he's still finding the characters and working out who they are. I love the fact that he brings in the village of Badass, that he's sort of starting to show the suburbs and the countryside outside Ankh Morpork. And we're also seeing a bit more of Ankh Morpork that we didn't see before, and seeing the wizards from a different point of view but he still hasn't quite found his place. This is still partly a satire on fantasy. When we come to Mort, the next book, things start to shift drastically. Part of the reason I think Esk doesn't appear again is because of this shift in themes. She wouldn't fit in the books as how Pratchett wrote them later on. Although she does kind of fit in right near the end because I think he gets more feministy and it did work in that context. But it's quite sad and it definitely makes this more of a standalone book. Even though it's got granny in it, it totally could have been any witch. It didn't have to be the same granny that's much more fleshed out in the next witch's book. So what did you think of this book? Let me know below. Am I covering the sort of things about these books that you'd like to see? Would you like me to delve deeper into the themes? or talk more about the impacts on the round world that these sort of ideas have. Comment below, give us a like, give us a subscribe, and press the bell if you want notifications of my next video. Bye.